Hey everyone, welcome back to Shane by Jack Schaefer with me, Jesse McCarthy, reading it aloud. If you've been following along, huge apologies for missing last weekend. I was actually building a fence for part of the house that we have here, and it was just crazy hard work. Took a lot longer than I ever imagined. It's beautiful. Maybe I'll try to get a shot of where we're at with it, um, a picture for you guys. But anyways, apologies. Let's get back into Shane. So last time, I think it was chapter 10, we hit the aftermath of the fight uh, between Shane with Joe later and some of Fletcher's crew. And Shane and Joe basically beat them all up, um, but they got pretty torn up themselves, got brought back to the house. And Shane was almost treated like a child by Joe because Joe was taking care of him, which was really cool to see that little turnaround because normally Shane's the one really taking care of Joe. But anyways, a little bit of stuff went on. Uh, if you don't recall it all, go back to chapter 10. I want to hop into chapter 11 because uh, I'm ready to see what's going to happen. All right. What happened in our kitchen that night was beyond me in those days, but it did not worry me because father had said it would be all right. And how could anyone knowing him doubt that he would make, he would make it so. And we were not bothered by Fletcher's men anymore at all. There might not have been a big ranch on the other side of the river sprawling up the valley and over on our side above Ernie Wright's place, for all you could tell from our house. They left us strictly alone and were hardly ever seen now, even in town. Fletcher himself, I heard from kids at school, was gone again. He went on the stage to Cheyenne and maybe farther, and nobody seemed to know why he went. So it's kind of like, well, Shane and Joe took care of business, so they're not having any trouble now, right? We'll see. Yet father and Shane were more wary than they had been before. They stayed even closer together and they spent no more time than they had to in the fields. There was no more talking on the porch in the evenings, though the nights were so cool and lovely, they called you to be out and under the winking stars. We kept to the house and father insisted on having the lamps well shaded and he polished his rifle and hung it ready loaded on a couple of nails by the kitchen door. Imagine having a rifle right above your kitchen door and your dad or your mom is has a thought that maybe they have to use it. Sketchy, scary. All this caution failed to make sense to me. So at dinner about a week later, I asked, is there something new that's wrong? That stuff about Fletcher is finished, isn't it? Finished? said Shane, looking at me over his coffee cup. Bobby boy, it's only begun. That's right, said father. Fletcher's gone too far to be back out now. It's a case of now or never with him. If he can make us run, he'll be setting pretty for a long stretch. If he can't, he'll be only a matter of time before he's shoved smack out of this valley. There's three or four of the men who looked through here last year ready right now to sharpen stakes and move in soon as they think it's safe. I'll bet Fletcher feels he's got a hold of a bear by the tail, and it'd be nice to be able to let it go. Why doesn't he do something then? I asked. Seems to be mighty quiet around here lately. Seems to you, huh? Said father. Seems to me you're mighty young to be doing much seeming. Don't you worry, son. Fletcher is fixing to do something. The grass that grows under his feet won't feed any cow. It'd be easier in my mind if I knew what he's up to. So basically, Bob here is thinking, oh, well, they just beat him up. So Fletcher's not going to cause any trouble. And Joe, his dad, is, is saying, hey, listen, this guy wants all of this land from all of us. And if he doesn't act to kick us off now, there's going to be more people coming in here to take some of this land. So he's got to make a choice. He's going to go hardcore and try to really kick us out, or he's going to back down and he's basically going to learn, lose all of his land ultimately. You see, Bob, Shane was speaking to me the way I liked, as if maybe I was a man and could understand all he said. By talking big and playing it rough, Fletcher has made this a straight win or lose deal. It's the same as if he kicked loose a stone that starts a rock slide and all he can do is hope to ride it down and hit bottom safe. Maybe he doesn't realize that yet. I think he does. And don't let things being quiet fool you. When there's noise, you know where to look and what's happening. 
when things are quiet, you got to be most careful. The mother sighed. She was looking at Shane's cheek where the cut was healing into a scar, like a thin line running back from near the mouth corner. I, I suppose you two are right, but does there have to be any more fighting? Like the other night? Asked father. No, Marion, I don't think so. Fletcher knows better now. He knows better, Shane said, because he knows it won't work. If he's the man I think he is, he's known that since the first time he sicked Chris on me. I doubt that was his move the other night. That was Morgan's. Fletcher will be watching for some way that has more finesse and will be more final. Hmm, said father, a little surprised. Some legal trick, huh? Could be, if he can find one. If not... Shane shrugged and gazed out the window. There are other ways. You can't call a man like Fletcher on things like that. Depends on how far he's willing to go. But whatever he does, once he's ready, he'll do it speedy and sure. Hmm, said father again. Now you put it that way. I see you're right. That is Fletcher's way. Bet you've bumped against someone like him before. When Shane did not answer, just kept staring out the window, he went on. Wish I could be as patient about it as you. I don't like this waiting. But we did not have to wait long. It was the next day of Friday when we were finishing supper that Lou Johnson and Henry Shipstead brought us the news. Fletcher was back, and he had not come back alone. There was another man with him. Lou Johnson saw them as they got off the stage. He had a good chance to look the stranger over while they waited in front of the post for horses to be brought in from the ranch. Since it was beginning to get dark, he had not been able to make out the stranger's face too well. The light striking through the post window, however, was enough for him to see what kind of man he was. He was tall, rather broad in the shoulders, and slim in the waist. He carried himself with a sort of swagger. He had a mustache that he favored, and his eyes, when Johnson saw them reflecting the light from the window, were cold and had a glitter that bothered Johnson. This stranger was something of a dude about his clothes. Still, that, that, that did not mean anything. When he turned, the coat he wore matching his pants flapped open, and Johnson could see what had been half hidden before. He was carrying two guns, big, capable 45s, in holsters hung fairly low and forward. Those holsters were pegged down at the, at the tips with thin straps fastened around the man's legs. Johnson said he saw the tiny buckles when the light flashed on them. I don't know if you remember, but Shane had talked about different gunfighters to Bob and how what their styles were and so forth. And anyone with two guns on their sides, right? And they're angled up in a way that's almost like getting ready to shoot somebody. Uh, that's a sign that this is not your normal type of random person living in the city or in, in one of these towns. This is probably a gunslinger or a gunfighter. Wilson was the man's name. That was what Fletcher called him when a cowboy rode up leading a couple of horses. A funny other name, Stark, Stark Wilson. And that was not all. Lou Johnson was worried and went into Grafton's to find Will Atke, who always knew more than anyone else about people apt to be coming along the road because he was constantly picking up information from the talk of men drifting into the bar. Will would not believe it at first when Johnson told him the name. What would he be doing up here? Will kept saying. Then Will blurted out that this Wilson was a bad one, a killer. He was a gunfighter said to be just as good with either hand and as fast in the draw as the best of them. He came to Cheyenne from Kansas, Will claimed he had heard, with a reputation for killing three men there, and nobody knew how many more down in the Southwest Territories where he used to be. Lou Johnson was rallying on, adding details as he could think of them. Henry Shipstead was slumped in a chair by the stove. Father was frowning at his pipe, absently fishing in a pocket for a match. It was Shane who shut off Johnson with a sudden suddenness that startled the rest of us. His voice was sharp and clear, and it seemed to crackle in the air. 
You could feel him taking charge of that room and all of us in it. When did they hit town? Last night. And you waited till now to tell it? There was disgust in Shane's voice. You're a farmer, all right, Johnson. That's all you will ever be. He whirled on father. Quick, Joe. Which one is the hottest head? Which one's the easiest to prod into being a fool? Tory, is it? Or Wright? Ernie Wright, father said. Get moving, Johnson. Get out there on your horse and make it to Wright's in a hurry. Bring him here. Pick up Tory too, but get right first. He'll have to go into town for that, Henry Shipstead said. We passed them both down the road, uh, riding in. Shane jumped to his feet. Lou Johnson was shuffling reluctantly toward the door. Shane brushed him aside. He strode to the door himself, yanked it open, started out. He stopped, leaning forward and listening. Hell, man, Henry Shipstead was grumbling. What's your hurry? We told them about Wilson. They'll stop here on their way back. His voice ceased. All of us could hear it now. A horse pounding up the road at full gallop. Shane turned back into the room. There's your answer, he said bitterly. He swung the nearest chair to the wall and sat down. The fire blazing in him a moment before was gone. He was withdrawn into his own thoughts, and they were dark and not pleasant. We heard the horse sliding to a stop out front. The sound was so plain you could fairly see the forelegs bracing and the hooves digging into the ground. Frank Torrey burst into the doorway. His hat was gone, his hair blowing wild. His chest heaved like he had been running as hard as the horse. He put his hands on the doorpost to hold himself steady, and his voice was a hoarse whisper, though he was trying to shout across the room at Father. Ernie's shot! They've killed him! The words jerked us to our feet, and we stood staring, all but Shane. He did not move. You might have thought he was not even interested in what Tori had said. Father was the one who took hold of the scene. Come in, Frank, he said quietly. Take it we're too late to help Ernie now. Sit down and talk and don't leave anything out. He led Frank Torrey to a chair and pushed him into it. He closed the door and returned to his own chair. He looked older and tired. It took Frank Torrey quite a while to pull himself together and tell his story straight. He was frightened. The fear was bedded deep in him and he was ashamed of himself for it. He and Ernie Wright, he told us, had been to the stage office asking for a parcel Ernie was expecting. They dropped into Grafton's for a freshener before starting back. Since things had been so quiet lately, they were not thinking of any, any trouble, even though Fletcher and the new man, Stark Wilson, were in the poker game at the big table. But Fletcher and Wilson must have been watching for a chance like that. They chucked in their hands and came over to the bar. Fletcher was nice and polite as could be, nodding to Tory and singling out Ernie for talk. He said he was about it. He said he was sorry about it, but he really needed the land Ernie had filed on. It was the right place to put up winter wind shelters for the new herd he was bringing in soon. He knew Ernie had not proved up on it yet. Just the same, he was willing to pay a fair price. So basically, that Ernie hasn't really, really developed the land, made it something great. So Fletcher's like, well, it's not really worth much, you know. And he's, Fletcher says, I'll give you $300, he said. And that's more than the lumber in your buildings will be worth to me. So basically telling the, Fletcher's basically telling Ernie, your place is a dump. I'm going to give you $300. It's not even worth that much, but I'll, I'll give it to you. Uh, and keep in mind, $300 today would not get you anything and not even like something in the house, let alone the whole house. But this is way back in the days, um, again, 1800s, late 1800s. So money was worth a lot more back then. Uh, but it's still not a good deal for Ernie to be taking $300 for this place. Okay, just get that clear. Ernie had had more than that of Ernie had more than that of his money in the place already. So he had already spent more than $300 to build up this house and his land. So um, 
He had turned Fletcher down three or four times before. He was mad the way he always was when Fletcher started his smooth talk. No, he said shortly. I'm not selling. Not now or ever. Fletcher shrugged like he had done all he could and slipped a quick nod at Stark Wilson. This Wilson was half smiling at him, but his eyes, Frank Torrey said, had nothing like a smile in them. I'd change my mind if I were you, he said to Ernie. That is, if you have a mind to change. And keep out of this, snapped Ernie. It's none of your business. Uh, I see you haven't heard, Wilson said softly. I'm Mr. Fletcher's new business agent. I'm handling his business affairs for him. His business with stubborn jackasses like you. Then he said what showed Fletcher had coaxed them to it. You're a damn fool, right? But what can you expect from a breed? That's a lie, shouted Ernie. My, my mother wasn't no Indian. Why, you crossbred squatter, Wilson said, quick and sharp. Are you telling me I'm wrong? So just some context here. So this gunman, this gunslinger, is telling Ernie Wright that he, his mom had, you know, been with another man and possibly an Indian. So this guy is like, he's a child of some random Indian that his mom had been with uh, back in the day. So this is not a nice thing to say to another person, to put it lightly. And uh, Ernie is getting worked up. I'm telling you, you're, you're a low crawling liar. The silence that shut down over the saloon was so complete, Frank Toy told us, that he could hear the ticking of the old alarm clock on the shelf behind the bar. Even Ernie, in the second his voice stopped, saw what he had done. But he was mad clear through and he glared at Wilson, his eyes reckless. So this would be like, you know, like a, an ultimate fighter, like the best fighter in the world that just like with one punch could knock you out and potentially kill you if the punch is strong enough. And, and Ernie Wright is just being calling him a liar to his face. You know, it, it's bad. Or if somebody was like robbing you at gunpoint and you started talking trash to that person because they have a gun that could potentially kill you. So it's a risky, risky move. So, said Wilson, satisfied now and stretching out the word with ominous softness. He flipped back his coat on the right side in front, and the holster there was free with the gun grip ready for his hand. You'll back that, right? Or you'll crawl out of here on your belly. Basically, either you're going to fight me in a gunfight, or you're going to walk out like a little, you know, weak you know, uh, how would I put it? Scared little boy. That's the option that he's given him. Ernie moved out a step from the bar, his arms stiff at his sides. The anger in him held him erect as he beat down the terror tearing at him. He knew what this meant, but he met it straight. His hand was firm on his gun and pulling up when Wilson's first bullet hit him and staggered him. So Ernie tried to get his own gun out to shoot this Stark. The second spun him halfway around and a faint froth appeared on his lips, on Ernie's lips, and all expression died from his face and he sagged to the floor. While Frank Torrey was talking, Jim Lewis and a few minutes later, Ed Howes had come in. Bad news travels fast and they seemed to know something was wrong. Perhaps they had heard that frantic galloping, the sound carrying far in the still night. They were all in our kitchen now, and they were more shaken and sober than I had ever seen them. I was pressed close to mother, grateful for her arms around me. I noticed that she had little attention for the other men. She was watching Shane, bitter and silent across the room. So that's it, father said grimly. We'll have to face it. We sell and at his price or he slips the leash on his hired killer. Did Wilson make a move toward you, Frank? He, he looked at me. 
Simply recalling that made Toy shiver through. He, he looked at me and said, Too bad, isn't it, mister? That right didn't change his mind. Then what? I got out of there quick as I could and came here. Jim Lewis had been fidgeting on his seat, more nervous every minute. Now he jumped up, almost shouting. But darn it, Joe. A man can't just go around shooting people. Shut up, Jim, growled Henry Shipstead. Don't you see the setup? Wilson badgered Ernie into getting himself in a spot where he had to go for his gun. Wilson can claim he's shot in self-defense. He'll try the same thing on each of us. That's right, Jim, put in Lou Johnson. Even if we tried to get a marshal in here, he, he couldn't hold Wilson. It was an even break, and the faster man won is the way most people will figure it, and plenty of them saw it. A marshal couldn't get here in, in time anyway. So if you remember, they don't really have a local like police station. So to try to get the police, hundred, I think it was like 100 plus miles away, they're just not going to get there in time before even more drama goes down. But we've got to stop it. Lewis was really shouting now. What chance have any of us got against Wilson? We're not gunmen. We're just a bunch of old cow hands and farmers. Call it anything you want. I call it murder. Yes. The word sliced through the room. Shane was up and his face was hard with the rock ridges running along his jaw. Yes, it is murder. Trick it out as self-defense or with fancy words about an even break for a fair draw. And it's still murder. He looked at father and the pain was deep in his eyes, but there was only contempt in his voice as he turned to the others. You five can crawl back in your burrows. You don't have to worry, yet. If the time comes, you can always sell and run. Fletcher won't bother with the likes of you now. He's going the limit and he knows the game. He picked right to make the play again, to make it plain. That's done. Now he'll head straight for the one real man in this valley. The man who's held you here and will go on trying to hold you and keep for you what's yours as long as there's life in him. He's standing between you and Fletcher and Wilson this minute, and you ought to be thankful that once in a while this country turns out a man like Joe Stark. And a man like Shane. Were those words only in my mind, or did I hear Mother whisper them? She was looking at him and then at Father, and she was both frightened and proud at once. Father was fumbling with his pipe, packing it and making a fuss with it like it needed his whole attention. The others stirred uneasily. They were reassured by what Shane said, and yet shamed that they should be. And they did not like the way he said it. You seem to know a lot about that kind of dirty business, Ed Howell said, with maybe an edge of malice to his voice. I do. Shane let the words lie there, plain and short and ugly. His face was stern and behind the hard front of his features was a sadness that fought to break through. But he stared levelly at Hal's, and it was the other man who dropped his eyes and turned away. Father had his pipe going. Maybe, maybe it's a lucky break for the rest of us, he said mildly, that Shane here has been around a bit. He can call the cards for us playing. Ernie might still be alive, Johnson if you had had the sense to tell us about Wilson right off. It's a good thing Ernie wasn't a family man. He turned to Shane. How do you rate Fletcher now he's shown his hand? You could see that the chance to do something, even just the talk of the problem pressing us, eased the bitterness in Shane. He'll move him in on Wright's place first thing tomorrow. He'll have a lot of men busy on this side of the river from now on probably push some cattle around behind the homesteads to keep the pressure plain on all of you. How quick he'll try you, Joe? Depends on how he reads you. If he thinks you might crack, he'll wait and let knowing what happened to Wright work on you. If he really knows you, he'll not wait more than a day or two to make sure you've had time to think it over, and then he'll grab the first chance to throw Wilson at you. He'll want it, like with Wright, in a public place will there be plenty of witnesses. If you don't give him a chance, he'll try to make one. Hmm, 
father said soberly. I was sure you'd give it to me straight, and that rings right. He pulled on his pipe for a moment. I reckon, boys, this will be a matter of waiting for the next few days. There's no immediate danger right off anyway. Grafton will take care of Ernie's body tonight. We can meet in town in the morning to fix him a funeral. After that, we'd better stay out of town and stick close to home as much as possible. I'd suggest you all study on this and drop in again tomorrow night. Maybe we can figure out something. I'd like to see how the town's taking it before I make up my mind on anything. They were ready to leave it at that. They were ready to leave it to father. They were decent men and good neighbors, but not a one of them, were the decision his, would have stood up to Fletcher now. They would stay as long as father was there. With him gone, Fletcher would have things his way. This was how they felt as they muttered their good nights and bunched out to scatter up and down the road. Father stood in the doorway and watched them go. When he came back to his chair, he walked slowly and he seemed haggard and worn. Somebody will have to go to Ernie's place tomorrow, he said, and gather up his things. He's got relatives somewhere in Niowa. No. There was a finality in Shane's tone. You'll not go near that place. Fletcher might be counting on that. Grafton can do it. But Ernie was my friend, father said simply. Ernie's past friendship. Your debt is to the living. Father looked at Shane and this brought him again into the immediate moment and cheered him. He nodded assent and turned to mother who was hurrying to argue with him. Don't you see, Joe? If you can stay away from any place where you might meet Fletcher and, and that Wilson, th things will work out. He can't keep a man like Wilson in this little valley forever. She was talking rapidly and I knew why. She was not really trying to convince father as much as she was trying to convince herself. Father knew it too. No, Marion. A man can't crawl into a hole somewhere and hide like a rabbit. Not if he has any pride. All right then, but, but can't you keep quiet and not let him ride you and drive you into any fight? That won't work either. Father was grim, but he was better and, and facing up to it. A man can stand for a lot of pushing if he has to, especially when he has his reasons. His glance shifted briefly to me. But there are some things a man can't take, not if he's to go on living with himself. I was startled as Shane suddenly sucked in his breath with a long, breaking intake. He was battling something with him in him that old hidden desperation, and his eyes were dark and tormented against the paleness of his face. He seemed unable to look at us. He strode to the door and went out. We heard his footsteps fading toward the barn. I was startled now at father. His breath too was coming in long broken sweeps. He was up and pacing back and forth. When he swung on mother and his voice battered at her, almost fierce in its intensity, I realized that he knew about the change in Shane and that the knowing had been cankering in him all the past weeks. That's the one thing I can't stand, Marion. What we're doing to him. What happens to me doesn't matter too much. I talk big and I don't belittle myself, but my weight in any kind of scale won't match his and I know it. If I understand, if I understood him then as I do now, I'd never have got him to stay on here but I didn't figure Fletcher would go this far. Shane won his fight before ever he came riding to this valley. It's been tough enough on him already. Should we let him lose just because of us? Fletcher can have his way. We'll sell out and move on. I was not thinking. I was only feeling. For some strange reason, I was feeling Shane's fingers in my hair, gently rocking my head. I could not help what I was saying, shouting across the room. Father. Shane wouldn't run away. He wouldn't run away from anything. Father stopped pacing, his eyes narrowed in surprise. He stared at me without really seeing me. He was listening to mother. Bob's right, Joe. We can't let Shane down. It was queer hearing her say the same thing to father she had said to Shane, the same thing with only the name different. He, 
he'd never forgive us if we ran away from this. That's what we'd be doing. This isn't just a case of Buck and Fletcher anymore. It isn't just a case of keeping a piece of ground Fletcher wants for his range. We've got to be the kind of people Shane thinks we are. Bob's right. He wouldn't run away from anything like that. And that's the reason we can't. Look at here, Marion. You don't think I want to do any running? No. You know me better than that. It'd go against everything in me. But what's my fool pride in this place and any plans we've had alongside of a man like that? I know, Joe. But you don't see far enough. They were both talking earnestly, not breaking in, hearing each other out and sort of groping to put their meaning plain. I can't really explain it, Joe. But I just know that we're bound up in something bigger than any one of us. And that running away is the one thing that would be worse than whatever might happen to us. There wouldn't be anything real ahead for us, any of us, maybe even for Bob, all the rest of our lives. Um, said Father. Tory could do it, and Johnson, and all the rest of them, and it wouldn't bother them too much. Joe, Joe Sterrett, are you trying to make me mad? I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about us. Hmm said Father softly, musing like to himself. The salt would be gone. There just wouldn't be any flavor. There wouldn't be much meaning left. Oh, Joe, Joe, that's what I've been trying to say. And I know this will work out some way. I don't know how, but it will. If we face it and stand up to it and have faith in each other, it'll work out because it's got to. That's a woman's reason, Marion. But you're part right anyway. We'll play this game through. It'll need careful watching and close figuring. But maybe we can wait Fletcher out and make him overplay his hand. The town won't take much this Wilson deal. Men like that fellow Weir have minds of their own. Father was more cheerful now that he was beginning to get his thoughts straightened out. He and mother talked low in the kitchen for a long time after they sent me to bed and I lay in my little room and saw through the windows the stars wheeling distantly in the far outer darkness until I fell asleep at last. All right, there's a lot going on in that chapter. Um, we got one of the homesteaders, Ernie Wright, is literally was killed, killed by this gunslinger that Fletcher has hired to run all these people out. Uh, it's interesting at the end there that Marion is basically saying they don't really have a choice um, whether to run or to stay because if they ran away, what would life be like after that? Um, it's kind of like, if you think about it, in my mind, it's like just letting evil or bad people win. Well, well we're scared. What are we going to do? We'll just let them take over this place. Um, go on killing people or threatening people. And what would be life be like if you back down from something like that? Um, I mean, for us in, in our town, in our town, in our culture now, in our society, we can call the police and hopefully they come and take care of somebody who's threatening us like this. But they didn't have that back then. So somebody has to step up and kind of be the police, be the good guy. And I think Marion is saying that's exactly what they need to do. And uh, I think Joe feels it deep down too. And they've got this heroic man that's, I mean, as good as anybody's going to get as a guy, Shane, to help them out. So it would just seem kind of crazy to run away. Uh, now, having said that, I think a lot of us would feel like, man, maybe we should just get out of here. We'll build a house somewhere else, right? But uh, again, what would that life be like? You're raising a kid and you know your child asks about the past and Oh, we ran away from this place when a bad man was trying to take it over. I don't know what that would be like. Anyways, lots more to say, but I know this is probably a long one. Yeah, I'm looking at the time. It's over 30 minutes, so yikes. Okay, let's do a face. Let's do Shane, who was kind of disgusted at the other homesteaders because he kind of knows that if Joe wasn't around to help them out, they would be long gone. 
and he's just disgusted by it all. So let's get a look on the face when he's looking at them kind of like, oh, you know, something he just doesn't really have a lot of respect for these guys that would run away. Like he, in, in opposition or in contrast to Joe, he has a lot of respect for. So a look of kind of contempt, disgust, just not happy with somebody. Okay. This is, this is Shane's face. Okay. That's mine. I'm curious what you got going. Thanks for hanging on. I hope you're having a good ride. Uh, this book is, man, it's powerful for me. Um, a moment I get look almost a little teary and little shivers on my arms. Anyways, I hope everything's going well in your world. Again, my apologies for this one being a week late. Um, but we'll get back on track next weekend uh, by Sunday. All right, guys. Adios for now.